So uh, to introduce our next speaker, we have uh, Sojana Poria, who's a, a well-known researcher in NLP. He's uh, previously uh, worked with Eric Cambria at uh, NPU on sentiment analysis and has struck out on his own now. And he's going to be talking about new work uh, that's not been yet reported uh, that he'd like to share with all of us in the room. So without further ado, let's have Sojana give his presentation. Thank you everyone for coming. Good afternoon. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, I I came to uh, NUS in 2012, so a long relation. So I came to uh, NUS and uh, saw the stadium and I liked it. And I I worked in the Temasek Laboratory as an intern. So yeah, that's my relation with NUS and I, I, I do come here often. So <clears throat> the topic I'm going to present today is emotional recognition in conversation. It's a pretty new topic, uh, which just started in 2000, uh, just been early 2018, beginning of 2018. And I'll discuss about uh, research challenges, the negative results, and in, the, in, a, in a pool of negative results, some good positive results also. Okay, so, um, we as researchers are mostly known about our work, so uh, to give a bit of introduction about my uh, work still now in the field of NLP, it's uh, uh, symbolic sentiment analysis, like you find linguistic rules to do sentiment analysis, then uh, move on to aspect extraction and aspect classification, from there to sarcasm detection, then uh, uh, multimodal sentiment analysis, from there, multimodal fusion, I have fused different modalities to do sentiment analysis. Then uh, I have also uh, developed some multimodal researches, actually our team has developed. And, and then we also work in affecting conversation, like the, at, at present we are working on it. And there are other works also like on question answering and also working on dialogue systems, which are not that major topic uh, of research, or major focus of my research till now. but they are also part of my research. Okay, so uh, first let's, uh, let's, let, let's, let's study the background. So what is conversational emotional recognition? So, so there is a conversation going on here and if you see that in this uh, dialogue, there is a uh, sentiment or emotion level for each utterance. So now the task is to detect the sentiment or emotion associated with each utterance in a dialogue or in a conversation. So this is dialogue, the simplest form of the conversation, like the two speakers. Uh, this is true for multi-party cases also. Like you, you label every uh, utterance with an emotion or sentiment level. Okay. So uh, what is the importance of CR? So it's basically for conversation understanding. In a conversation, like for example, in a dialogue system, you really need to know what both both the speakers are, or what the other speaker is actually talking about so that you can generate the dialogue uh, effectively. And like in healthcare system for psychological analysis, for example, you are building a e-healthcare system where you are talking to, where the agent is talking to the <coughs> patient. And for that, you need to analyze the depression or other psychological uh, aspects and you need to understand the emotion and sentiment associated with the uh, with each utterance of the speaker like you really need to analyze these aspects and for other areas also hr e-learning like the similar cases and this is an example like this is uh, like in 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 modern uh, sequence to sequence modern dialogue system this is basically a sequence to sequence network like you have a training corpus you give a sentence and generate the next sentence. So, uh, but you, you assume that the classifier automatically understands the affect and emotion associated with the user so that you can generate uh, effective uh, dialogue. But uh, this is not true. So in uh, most of the sequence to sequence network, uh, actually it fails to generate effective dialogue. So unless you provide the effective knowledge, unless you, uh, unless you give the power to the uh, model power to the system to understand affect of the conversation affect of the other user it would not generate the responses uh, correctly 
So in this particular example, uh, if, the, if the user is saying I'm really dissatisfied with the service, the bot should um, generate the sentence, we are sorry to hear that, how can you improve instead of generating why is that so? Yeah, so <clears throat> now the challenges. So this is a difficult problem to do and there are multiple challenges involved in this uh, area. Now the first is um, <laughs> emotion categorization. So this is related to the data collection process. So, when you uh, when you collect the data, when you annotate, send the data to for annotation, you need to select uh, the emotion categorization model to annotate it. And there are multiple categorization model exists. So Ekman's model, Plutchik's model, models. <coughs> there are multiple. One model is simple, like the Ekman's model. The other one is complex. Now, which model do you use, uh, which categorization model do you select to for the annotation? If you go for the complex one, then you risk the less inter annotator agreement because you have multiple classes, there will be for sure less Kappa score. But uh, if you go for the simple one, you may miss the complex emotions. This is not just positive, negative, and neutral. This is emotion, there are complex emotions. So uh, there is another emotion categorization. Uh, uh, more model there are much so of balance and arousal so this is basically a balance is just what positive emotion or negative emotion are shown in the picture and arousal is whether you are very excited or you are very calm so <clears throat> and it it is a regression problem when you select balance and arousal it's basically a regression problem you can cast it to the uh, classification problem also but mostly it assigns a um, <coughs> real number uh, to the, I mean, it's, it's a regression problem basically. You, uh, you know, give that whether the person is very happy, like 0 0.7 to 1, or less happy, like that. Okay, so now emotion annotation. So, when you send the data for emotion annotation, what could be uh, the challenges? So, first is the self assessment. We don't really do it often, uh, but it's the best way basically that the speakers who are who participate in the conversation if they annotate their own emotion that's the best way so that can be done in a post conversation like you have the you record the whole conversation you have everything and then you ask the annotators to uh, annotate it um, or you do it real time like but but that's not possible right you you, you cannot ask the annotators uh, while they are having the conversation to annotate it that's not possible then uh, scripted conversation. So uh, for a, so, so you, you have a script like a movie script or any other script, and you uh, and and yeah. So so the, the, that's the data basically, and you send it for the level. But you know this kind of scripted conversation, uh, the you can you can you can easily see the bias because in order to give more effective information in the script. In order to give more effective in, you know, information in the script, uh, so the, the script writers tend to use effective words in the scripts. So <clears throat> that induces bias. So next is situational awareness versus speaker perception. So now in this sentence, if you look at this example, I would get all the property if he dies with a laugh. So in this example, if you if you if you know to see this example, the speaker's perspective is uh, positive. But should annotator really level it with a positive emotion or positive sentiment? Because like later I will I will I will show you some examples where as inter speaker uh, dependency is very important to uh, to to detect the emotion correctly or correctly. But, so in this case, what should be the level? So the base to sorry, the best way is you go for unscripted uh, uh, conversation for the annotations, like uh, collect uh, recordings from from YouTube, which are natural conversation, not just scripted. Uh, not sure about the interviews because nowadays in India, especially the interviews are very much. Uh, scripted um, and also the situation ever annotations like so in this example 
the best way could be to level it with negative emotion because that's the situation awareness although for the speaker perspective this is positive but it can really influence it can it, it generates a negative sentiment or emotion and it influence other speakers in my sentiment or emotion so this is basically a negative one now next is context modeling so till now emotion recognition and sentiment analysis are not really context dependent like the state of the art in this field but in this example like this is the typical nature of a conversation so when we engage into a conversation we usually use just uh, we usually use this kind of markers which are we do not contain explicit affective markers so if you really rely just only on uh, content or ignore the context and just consider the content you risk to miss the chance of detecting the correct sentiment or emotion in these two examples you can see that what is residue the person who replies uh, with yeah and the uh, similar example in the in a uh, similar example you can see here also but the emotion expressed with the both both like the, these two are same or what but the but expressing opposite emotion so this is very contextual okay now um <clears throat> in this context uh, modeling uh, interperson dependency is also an important factor for example if you just see this uh, sentence you can if you understand that there is a there is a negative there probably there is a negative emotion but it is very hard to detect whether it is frustrated or not okay but if you see that there is an interperson dependency so so the whole in whole conversation it goes like this way. neutral 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 and then suddenly a frustrated emotion expressed by person b that influences person a to express a negative or frustrated emotion so this kind of uh, interperson dependency modeling uh, understanding how two persons communicate among each other is a very hard problem to do and it's a part of context model so we can have all the sophisticated lstm networks geodo networks to model the sequential structure of a conversation but in the end to do this it's not that straightforward it's very difficult to do okay now emotion sit in the same example if we notice that here the emotion sit from neutral to frustrated i will later come to the negative results part of it and i will explain that why this is a very hard problem to do suppose i have everything uh, like i have all this conversation with me given this input can i predict that whether the emotion of person a uh, changes from neutral to frustrated it's, it's it's a very hard problem and in our experiment we found that the system performs very well when there is uh, the, there is no emotion sit or there is an emotion sit which is in the same direction like from happy to excited or from excited to happy but from happy to sad this is very critical to understand this needs context modeling so these challenges are actually very much correlated okay now fine grained emotion recognition if you see this example you can find that all this is this is a positive uh, emotion basically you face as a positive balance but this is not positive this is negative but on government's bill if you consider this fine grain information so what is the opinion what is the emotion expressed on the government's bill they are probably giving expressing the same opinion same emotion but it's very hard to detect unless you really dig into the details the fine grain emotion another challenge okay so next challenge is multi party conversation so we discussed a lot of lot about dialogues but what about multi parties if you have a conversation where multiple uh, speakers are involved how how can we do it and so there would be problems like when you 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 say something how the other listeners the how, how the listeners are reacting to it how their emotions are changing when you speak this is a very fundamental problem and very difficult to do it we tried to do it we failed it's an open research problem first of all when you have multimodal data like video data you have to understand uh, who is the listener and who is the speaker that's a very difficult part 
But even though if you have that level uh, understanding this relation, how what you are saying affecting others, it's a very difficult problem. And then the co-reference, whether I am now talking to you or talking to you, it is an open problem. It is an open problem to detect this. I, I think your student was working on it. Yeah. Yes, so <coughs> next challenge. Okay, sarcasm. Now if you if you look at this example, these sentences are in a, in the conversation, it's very much contextual. To uh, to detect this sentence as sarcastic was that place the sun. You need to you need to know, you, you need to understand this conversation. And if you don't have this, uh, if your system does not have the ability to detect this sarcasm in the paper which, which, which is presented <coughs> in the conversation, it will fail. It would not be able to detect the sentiment and emotion correctly. And uh, <coughs> yeah, so traditional CR system fails basically. For, 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 for these things. Now, let's uh, discuss about recent advances. So, we indeed tried to do um, the emotion recognition in conversation. We achieved uh, some performance improvement over the previous uh, works which did not consider the conversational factors for the modeling. But we failed also in more doing some parts like for sarcasm extraction, for listener party modeling, in, in those things for emotion seed detection, we failed. Okay, let's, let's discuss about those things. Okay. So first thing first, data sets. We have a good number of data sets here. The IMO kept data set, for example, uh, it came uh, in, it, it was published in, I think 10 years back, almost a decade ago. But why am I saying that the the topic is very new. Although the data sets were there, although the conversational uh, scripts were there, but no one actually tried to understand how emotional recognition and conversation should be done, the role of each speaker, the speaker specific modeling, the modeling considering the context, no one has done it ever. So this has start, just started in 2018. So this is why this topic is new. Although the data sets of IMO and Simen published almost a decade ago. The rest of the data sets, Emotional Alliance is a very new data set. We created mail uh, uh, earlier this year. There is another data set called Daily Dialogue. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Now, the motivation. So before we start to design a very complicated, very sophisticated deep networks, the deep revolution is a revolutionary network. Let's first understand what are the factors that influence con uh, conversation and emotional recognition. Simply three factors. First, the previous utterances. Speakers of the previous utterances, like for the speaker specific modeling. And then emotions uh, expressed by the previous utterances. Okay. Now, once we have all of them, how can we design these factors in a model? We proposed a network called Conversational Memory Network in uh, NECL 2018. It's basically uh, maintains two separate memory for each of the persons, person A and person B. So this is one memory block and you can see all, uh, each element in this memory block actually represents uh, one utterance. And these utterances are sequential, so basically you represent this memory using a LSTM, GRU, or any RNN, or it can be a memory block, but you have positional encoding to somehow maintain the sequential nature of this memory block. Now, once you have a, an input UI, you can compute um, the similarity, like basically, uh, this, is, this should not be called similarity, but basically an attention, like how it attends to this part for the context modeling. And, <coughs> can let us sum up it as a memory output for the final classification. Now, I saw the detailed uh, explanation here. For example, this is the memory input for person A, and that is for person B. 
and you want you have to classify uh, UI. So you basically <coughs> calculate the attention score here, which is basically a dot product and then a softmax. And uh, then once you do this, you get an output and you multiply out this output with the input and you get another representation and you repeat it multiple times. And finally, once you have that, you can sum it up here as output of <coughs> person A. And once you do it multiple times, you for the final output, you send it to the softmax for the classification. So basically, this is just a memory network. So you maintain memory for both person A and person B. You send an input. You do attention to both the memories to find, uh, to, to, to actually model the uh, uh, context. Then once you have that, you send it for the classification, as simple as that. Now, there are many drawbacks here. What we wanted to do, or now what we said before, that there are three factors which influenced conversational emotional recognition. The speaker of the sentence, the context of the sentence, we really account uh, of <coughs> to context of the sentence, but we are not handling the speaker of the utterance. So if you, if you go back here, if you see this, the speaker information is not attached to it. So this is a problem in that network. Now, now another problem is that we model the sequential nature of the utterances of a speaker. But in a conversation, the conversation flows this way. Person A speaks something, then person B, then again person A, probably person A speaks again, then person B. So there is a sequence among the speaker order also. So we, we did not consider that in the model. Okay. So then we proposed this in last year AAAI, called it dialogue RNN. Now it is, it is a complex RNN, which is composed of three different RNNs. First is to model the speaker state. This is basically uh, an attention over, uh, over, the, over a global memory that connects uh, between two speaker state. Then a global RNN that basically connects the history of the <coughs> history till uh, time t minus one. And it uh, using the RNN, it gets the uh, present time timestamp, the represent global state representation at the present timestamp. Then it uh, has an emotion uh, RNN that basically connects the previous emotion uh, state at time t minus one and get the uh, emotion representation at time t. And if you notice the equations, there is a recurrence involved. For example, you start with this step at time t minus one. So for example, you have this uh, as null or zero vector when you start uh, by doing it from left to right of the conversation, then you get a state here. Now you come to this equation. To calculate the speaker state, you consider the previous speaker state and you do an attention. This attention is written here. It's basically an attention over the previous time step of the global history. So these two are basically connected. And finally, what you do you have, you have another zero for emotion representation calculation where it takes the previous state of that uh, zero, that zero, and the present state of the speaker state. So these three zeros are actually interconnected. So visually, we can see it like that. At time t, you have this input. You calculate the uh, speaker, speaker state based on the previous speaker state and attention over the global zero, global zero connects between the speaker states. So using this, you get the uh, speaker state at the present time. Then from there you uh, classify, like you, you get the emotion level. Now you use uh, this state to update uh, this zero. So you get GT, you update this state. Now for speaker B, you have, uh, suppose you have uh, at time t plus one, you have an input. You do the same thing, do the attention, 
and update the state of the speaker B. So this thing you basically can see that as a connection. Like this state is by speaker B, this state is by speaker A, but they are connected using a zero. So we are remodeling, we are connecting the speaker states. Okay, yeah. Yes. So in your motion RNN, does it understand that uh, there are two different speakers involved or is it just sequentially modeling? Yeah, it's just sequen sequentially modeling, but we are, uh, no, we, we, we are not <coughs> sending the information explicitly. Yeah, but we are maintaining the sequence. They are, in, in this year we are, we are modeling the speaker's connection is basically using this GRO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you also notice the equation of emotion GRO, yeah. it is modeled there also. Right, right. Yeah, because we are sending the speaker state and that speaker state can come from either here or there. So yeah. Okay. Now, we have some examples here. For example, if this is the traced utterance, so you see that you know this, this depends on uh, utterance 41 and utterance 42. Those are by <laughs> different speakers. For example, utterance 42 is by person B, and also the same for utterance uh, no, the utterance PA by utterance 41 is by person A. But utterance 42, which is also important to classify this, that is that that was uttered by person B. So, so the how why interperson <laughs> dependency is an important factor. Yeah. Oh, you you were taking the picture, right? Eh? Is it done? Uh, sorry, I have a question for you. Sure. The self and interspeaker that I have in the self is the speaker one, and uh, you mean what? What is the self? Mean? Yeah, self here is uh, person A. So we person we want to classify with forty four. Utterance 44, that is by person A, and we saw that uh, it is important, like person, uh, utterance number 41, which is by person B, A, person A. Yeah, which is person A and B. Yeah. This is just the attention visualization. Okay, and uh, suppose we have information about all the conversation. It's not a real-time system. We have all the information, like what has been utter till now what has been in the dialogue till now and at time t and what will happen in the time t plus one to time t plus n like we have access to all of this we found that using this uh, if we if we utilize this information then both the past and future actually help okay why so it's basically suppose we i give you a uh, sentence and i remove a word from it Okay, suppose I am a boy and I, I remove M uh, from it and I ask you to predict that what should be after I to say it is M, it, it should be M. How can you say it? It's basically your, uh, you understand the context, you know that uh, I am should be after I and this whole order makes a complete sentence so you have an idea of the context. So in a conversation, if you want to predict the uh, this emotion of utterance yeah, UT, we found similarly that utterance from UT plus 1 to UT plus N and utterance 1 to utterance T minus 1, all these actually help both past and future for better context modeling. Yeah, and also uh, like how far should we look into the contextual history? So we have a large conversation, long conversation, for example. How much context do we really need for emotion recognition at time t? How far should we look past? And I found that at some sometimes the long range distant utterances actually help. So to classify utterance 34, we found that utterance 11 and utterance 14 actually help. But this was not quite a trend in the model. So sometimes it helped, but maybe, for, but, but we found it very, for very few, like two or three percent of uh, utterances for which we really found distant utterances help. I will let us show the uh, picture, uh, which will, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, what type of data do you use to describe? Uh, this, 
Oh, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Yeah, so, uh, we have done this on IEMO cap. Yeah, so the data set table, I yeah, the, the, that data set table which I presented that contains the first uh, entry in that table is IEMO cap. Yeah, but this was just for very few utterances, it was not quite a trend, and we found that the context uh, window is just uh, five. Uh, just 10, 10 utterances like this yeah okay so this is the figure i was talking about so this figure is showing basically that both past and future help in context modeling but if you notice that this is the contract history length like 0 to minus 60 like the past and 0 to 6 lakh, suppose you have 120 uh, conversation in a 120 utterances in a uh, dialogue and we found that, that if you see that actually this person may contribute most for the uh, performance so you, you, you do not necessarily look into too far while modeling the context but important thing is actually you know this is quite symmetric if you see that both past and future is helping Okay, this is the result. Basically, uh, this is the result. So, this was by CMN, and this is this is just two variants of our uh, dialogue RNA, and we found that uh, dialogue RNA improved the performance over CNN by a huge margin. It's basically because it models those factors like how it interconnects to uh, speaker states. Okay. So. You know, you, you showed the pendency on future information, but you know, humans don't have access to that. Yeah. So how, how does that, how do you re reconcile these two differences? In real time, it is not possible to deploy this model. Mm -hmm. If you have this bidirectionality, no, bidirectionality is still, it is possible, but future, um, you know, depending on future information is not possible in uh, real time. Yeah, but the single, uh, like uh, when you do not consider future, it also performs quite well, like better than CNN. So you can still actually deploy it in real time. Yeah. When you, when you only use the past context. Right? Yeah, yeah. Do you have uh, results for that? Or you use just I, I, I have, but I do not show it here, uh, but, 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 but I do have the results. Mm -hmm. We saw it in now. We, we we gave these results in our paper. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about the negative results. We saw a lot of positivity, but let's 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 discuss about the negative results, which are the most interesting, but I think even most difficult thing to address. Now, oh, sorry. Now, bile stream CRF for CR. We saw that CER conversational emotional recognition is, an, is a kind of sequence prediction problem. Now in sequence prediction tasks in NLP, for example, NER, US tagging, we we do use uh, BioLSTM CRF. That's the state of the art now. That you use BioLSTM CRF, you initialize BioLSTM with BART or ELMO, whatever. But you, but as, as a classifier, you use BioLSTM CRF. But we found that BioLSTM CRF performs very poorly uh, compared to just BioLSTM. Why? Now, while while uh, while digging into the details, we found that there is not really a grammar to learn. What does it mean? It means that when you model when you use CRF in your task, when you use CRF for NER for POS tagging, you really found there is a sequence that after this kind of POS tags, it is possible to have this POS tags. Okay? Or after this certain NER sequence, an, an, an name entity sequence, this name entity should occur. But in this case, we did not have such patterns. Now, Question comes, so does content play more important role than the labels? Is there so we, we found that CRF did not perform well, so there is no level dependency. So does content uh, play more important role than the labels? So this is an open question basically for us to consider the why a uh, bilestem CRF fails 
and why i mean how how should we frame this problem now another important point for future experiments we replace suppose we replace uh, the emotion uh, categorization which is a more difficult problem and we replace it with the sentiment analysis just positive negative and neutral will it improve like will, will the performance improve it's an interesting point basically when you have too many class levels like in emotional categorization you have six class levels or eight class levels and when and the emotion uh, levels are very much related to each other for example happy and excited they are related or uh, anger disgust they are very much related they are i mean positive emotions and negative emotions if you replace that with just balance like sentiment positive negative and neutral i believe it should improve i mean using bilestem crf should improve because in conversation there should be a grammar which maintains uh, the stability of uh, mind like you, you should not fluctuate too much plus minus plus minus like that there should be a certain pattern but then it makes the task easier you do not really understand the emotion you just understand that whether the person is in a positive mind state or negative mind state like that okay so sarcasm recognition data sets so this is very interesting after 1.5 years of data collection data quality check and annotation you would be surprised what we have we have this as sarcastic data we could just collect over 300 sarcastic conversation the conversation which contains sarcasm it's very hard to do like most of the uh, samples you get non sarcastic i just showed the balance data set here but the imbalance data set we have is much larger like the most of the samples are uh, non sarcastic but this is to show that how hard it is to collect sarcasm uh, sarcastic data from the available movie scripts or available tv episodes and to uh, to to you know to to recruit to hire annotators to annotate it properly we often found a lot of incorrect annotations yeah and we found another interesting thing we found that dl performs similar to random baseline like the dl here is deep learning why is that so we believe this is because the data set size is very small and there are a lot of number of number of parameters in uh, deep learning like a huge number of parameters are there so we believe that that causes it yes you tried more simplistic model yes we tried svm uh, and it outperformed from deal without support by the data yeah we 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 submitted this paper in this year acl That's a that, that's a good idea. There there are corpus we we, we could return, but we did not do it. Actually, uh, yeah, Reddit. Their Twitter data which is not so reliable, but there is a Reddit corpus which is much bigger. Uh, you can use it actually. Yes. Yes. Use it for Uh, experimenting uh, pre training on uh, Twitter. No, this is not related to chatbot though. Yeah. yeah, but there are some Twitter sarcastic corpus. But training on a Twitter corpus risks the way of the like Twitter uses a lot of informal language. So, yeah. not really sure how well it will uh, correlate with this kind of data. But there's another data called Reddit, which uses more formal language, I believe. Like, I don't have much social media experience. But we could use that, but simply the you know excuse is we did not have much time to do that experiment, so yeah, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so 
as you can see that that's a good point so as you can see that um, these are basically tv episodes so it also involves uh, different modalities like acoustic modality visual modality so we not only look at the text but we also looked at uh, different modalities to level it and uh, i actually skipped one example in the previous slide where i showed actually how different modalities actually uh, you know if, if text says that it's a positive sentence but visual say and acoustic modality behaves differently that um, those two modalities suggest that it's sarcastic yeah Ah, we, we, we used simply uh, by looking at the video, you say that whether it is sarcastic or not sarcastic and also say that whether uh, it is a uh, po positive sentiment or negative sentiment or neutral. Okay. Yeah. But uh, after, so, so the annotation process was complicated. So after each hundred uh, samples, we evaluated the annotations. We made sure, so we had a set of videos for quality control. And we 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 asked we, we, we randomly sampled the, those videos in the annotations, so we we did some quality checking. So it's a, it's a long process, and that, that this is why it took quite a bit of time. So when I ask you for the team, I imagine you specify video and audio. Like yeah. Yes. So you have people annotating the videos. Right? Yeah, annotating the videos. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just looking um, and when you annotate using the videos, you have the transcript as a yeah, you have the transcript as a caption, or uh, and also, yeah, the acoustic modality, like you can hear the audio, yeah. Okay, now emotion C prediction, the negative result. Now, here is the task definition. Given the context, previous and present utterance of the speaker, can we predict whether the emotion of the speaker shifts from his or her previous utterance? This is the task definition. Now, we apply dialogue earner on it, we performed very poorly, only 47%. Next, we designed a classifier, like a simple binary classifier, which classifies shift versus no shift. Like we have all this input, we designed a classifier, which classifies whether there will be a shift or no shift from this utter, from this emotion. We found that it performs below the random baseline. Like you ran, if you perform randomly this uh, experiment, we found that the classifier actually performs below it. Below this. Yes. So in your classifier, you sample because I guess this label will allow you to sample um, by samples, right? So you have many fewer possible samples than negative samples. So when you change the classifier, did you? You sample to get balanced. Oh, you mean the uh, class weight? Yeah. Loss weight, right? Yes, yeah. yes. We, we, we indeed used it, but but still it, it performed very poor. Yeah. It's very slow. I have a question. Yes. How did you operationalize emotion shift? Did you operationalize it as a change in measurement from happy to excited or a change, an absolute change from positive to negative that is that, that a good question so so basically as, a, as as i said before when you cast this problem to positive emotion to positive emotion yeah, yeah. it would be easier to solve this task but then that would not give you more, more insight yes it is much harder to say that whether this person is excited uh, also happy like from happy to excited or okay so this particular problem had yeah happy to excited okay. that's the kind of thing that's and more, even that was hard it's very hard. Now, if you if you say from positive emotion to positive emotion, it's easier. Right. But when you say that happy to excited, that means it's fine, fine grained yes. evaluation. That is difficult. Okay. I mean, we are not even saying about happy to sad. That is even more difficult. Right. Oh, no, I have some other results. But I'd be happy to get the feedback as well. Okay, okay, sure. So, uh, again, yeah. to go to Kokhil's question, how yeah. do you operationalize? What do you mean by shift? So it means any any shift from happy to excited is a shift, or between a positive and a negative. Yeah, any, anything from happy to other emotion is ah. a shift. Yeah. But, but you know, I mean, I mean the experiment can be easily done on from positive valence to positive valence. I mean, yeah. What is the spectrum of emotions that you use? Ah, it's just Ekman plus neutral. Uh, Ekman six and levels then, and then in neutral. Did you also use uh, intensity level? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, 
there are intensity levels I did not show in the in this slides, but there are like for example valence and arousal domains they have intensity levels. Yes. So regression does. So and gamma fish, gamma fish are part of gamma fish and radar. They use slides, they use like scales, they use the Ah okay. So this the uh, this method is on uh, IMOCAP dataset. Okay. So it was done by uh, University of Southern California, I think, USC. Yeah. So they did it, and they did it on a scale basis. Yeah. yeah. Like zero to one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now we tried another thing. We 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 thought that if we add shift versus no shift binary classifier to dialog RNA, it would act as a regularizer. Like, if we cast this problem as a multitasking uh, problem, but the performance was even worse. I really don't know the reason. Instead of improving the performance, the performance was worse. Multitasking. Yeah, because I thought uh, that shift versus no shift binary classifier would act as a regularizer. Yeah. It was not. Okay. Now, future directions. So yeah, so it's it's completely based on my belief that I, I hope that the future direction will go this towards like first few words like multimodal sarcasm classifier, effective reasoning and emotion safety detections. Like it's also displaying that how I would do things in future in this domain specifically related to this domain. And then you then we <coughs> we should cover multi-party conversations, effective dialogue system understanding personality for building an effective dialogue systems and finally it should do effective common sense and fully full fledged multimodal effective personalized dialogue systems for multiple sectors so these are kind of details that you know we are now constructing this data set we submitted uh, we, we submitted this paper to ACL this year that you, you use multiple modalities to detect sarcasm in, in conversation. Then you use, uh, then we uh, try to do effective reasoning. So for example, in this example, we should find reason why C is frustrated. What should be the reason of it? This is called effective reasoning. Then we also, uh, as, as I explained before, we, we should also understand that can we predict that whether the emotion uh, I mean, whether the emotion, there will be emotion shift from neutral to frustrated. This is called emotion shift, which is much harder problem to do. Yeah, then in multi-party conversation, identify the speakers in visual modality, also explore the listener parties, how their behavior is changing based on the speakers. <clears throat> then effective dialogue generation, I showed this example before. Then a full phrase system should do like this. For example, you are a personalized effective dialogue system should have the capability of uh, such things. Like if you say, how are you? And the user, if the bot says, how are you? And the user says, not very well, I had an accident. Then the bot should refer to identify the term accident and find the effect of it. Collision, <coughs> like how, how did that accident happen based on collision? or did you uh, get in yourself injured from the accident, like that. Then the bot should also uh, get the, understand the emotion of the sentence and generate an em empathetic response. Oh, so, so sorry to hear, did you get injured? And if the user says, suppose replies, yeah, not very serious though, can you guess what happened? Then the bot, if it has understand the personality or hobby of the user, it generates the response uh, accordingly instead of selecting other sentences like uh, like other terms like carelessness falling uh, like <coughs> it should select uh, like other like playing football or carelessness it should select that falling could be the reason because the person has habit of playing uh, of running every evening so yeah so this is kind of kind of a you know very uh, you know a generalized case like in, in an ideal scenario, we should have a bot, we should have a dialogue system which is personalized and effective, which has all the capability. I believe that a dialogue system is a complete NLP. In a dialogue system, we, we should have everything, discourse understanding uh, and NER, of course, cause causal effect, NLI, everything, dialogue system. And 
that's the difficult and hardest thing to do and the sequence to sequence just performing sequence to sequence is not enough yeah okay so this is inference and this is personalized response okay thanks to our academic collaborators uh, from CMU, LP Morency, Rada from Image, Prof. Roger is here from NUS, thank you, and Alexander from IPN, My ind our industrial collaborators, Bloomberg, Esther, and Adobe Research, and of course our team, uh, Navhanil, Gangeshwar, Dev is here, Dipannai, and Hayun is here, and, and of course, thanks to you for hosting me and inviting thanks to you for inviting me thank you <laughs> yeah good question yes sir uh, just a couple of things so for the smart app you said to use